I think as parents, we all know this intuitively, but let's get down to the details about why consequences are an important part of positive parenting. So why are consequences an important part of positive parenting? Going back to our basic parenting model, we have to keep track of how control and maturity are related to each other. So you'll remember that control means control over your own life. And it goes from zero control down here at the bottom to 100% control up here at the top. And you can have all of the control or none of the control or somewhere in between. This is true for you as a parent. It's true for your kids. And I think all human beings are dealing with how much control do I have over my own life? Now this x-axis down here is about maturity, how grown up you are. The most common way that we think about maturity is age. So starting over here on the left, when you're first born, how much control do you have over your own life? Hardly any. You can make a big noise and a big stink, but it's clear down here at the bottom. Now what about as an adult? How much control do you have? I know you're seeing a lot of small print at this point because we don't always feel like we have a lot of control, right? In certain elements or in certain areas of our life. When I ask teenagers this question, how much control do the adults have? Oh, they're quick with the answer. 100%, they got all the control. Okay, let's just go with what the teens are saying for purposes of our model. As an adult, theoretically, you have 100%. So it's way up here. In our model, we draw a line to connect these two dots, showing that our control in life increases as we become more mature. But it's not about age as much as it's about stability. Stage. So that's where we divide our graph into three different chunks or stages. And I call these stage one, stage two, and stage three. I know, brilliant, huh? These three stages are stages of moral development. So quick review of those stages. On stage one, we are selfish and self-centered and immature in so many ways. Stage one is characterized by tantrums and fighting and manipulating. So this is fun, right? I mean, you think of your kids. Are they on stage one? Wow. If kids are on stage one, they don't get to have very much control for themselves. The self-control is this part under the line. They don't get to have much control. Someone else has to take up most of the control. That's where you come in as a parent. Now when we move to stage two, we stop fighting and start cooperating. Cooperation is the dividing line between stage one and stage two. That's how we can tell that a kid's on stage two. They're willing to cooperate. They don't want any trouble. They want to keep the peace. So they're going to go along with reasonable requests and they're going to negotiate and try to come up with a win-win solution. Uh, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. This is a more cooperative stage of development. When kids go there, they can have more control. Parents don't need to take as much. Stage three, that's really cool. That's all about initiative where you see what needs to be done and you do it. Stage three is characterized by responsibility and empathy and morals and values and basically doing the right things for the right reasons. When your kids are doing that, they get to have most of the control and you as a parent back way off, hardly any control. We review this model in today's video because it becomes essential to understanding the role of consequences. So let's take a look at your role as a parent at each of these three stages. On stage one, remember this is where our kids are selfish and self-centered and manipulating. 
There's only one thing that works consistently and well on stage one, and that is consequences. Consequences, why? Because at stage one, their little minds are thinking in terms of what's in it for me or am I going to get clobbered for this? It's very externalized and that's why consequences are the only thing that works reliably at stage one. Now consequences bleed over to stage two, but at stage two we add another C word. We're going to do communication. which of course carries over to stage three as well. But we don't focus so much on communication at stage one. We focus on the consequences because they're not listening. So we want to make sure that they have what they need at this stage. Now, there's a big difference in the kind of consequences we use at stage two versus stage one. And it has to do with, do you remember what I said the dividing line was here between one and two? Cooperation. Yeah, and that's the difference because some consequences require cooperation. Those are fine to use at stage two. Other consequences don't require cooperation. And that's the kind we have to use at stage one. Why? Because we don't have cooperation yet. It doesn't even kick in until stage two. That's the importance of consequences. You're probably wondering, well, what about stage three? Stage three is where we go to consultation. This is really cool, you guys. This is where your kids come to you and they ask you for your wise and sagely advice and you give it to them and they're like, oh, thank you, dear sweet mother. I will go apply those principles that you've taught me and my life will be so much better. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, and then they run off to their own five kids. Right now, can kids do stage three at a younger age? Yeah, they can, but it's about stage, not age. So consultation, we don't have to do a lot of discipline at stage three because it's all self-discipline. Getting back to our initial question for this video, why are consequences so important in positive parenting? It's because that's the only thing that works when our kids are on stage one and we're going to be using consequences at stage two to help them learn the principles that will enhance their life and help them to have control. Now let's take a few minutes to talk about some examples because I get a lot of questions. Oh, and by the way, if you have specific questions for me, just go ahead and make a comment down below and I'll respond or you can send me a message through the website. I get this question all the time. Dr. Paul, what are some examples of consequences that I can use at stage one that don't require any cooperation? And then let's compare that and contrast it with consequences that can happen at stage two that do require cooperation. And this changes at different ages because you think about a toddler, for example, a two-year-old. You control much more about that child's life than you do a 12-year-old or a 22-year-old. You tracking this? So what you control is the key when we're talking about stage one consequences. What do you control? You control what you provide. Okay, now I got to give a little disclaimer here because there's five freebies that you have to provide. Everything else is negotiable. The five freebies are, I think in this order, number one, love. Your job as a parent is to love them no matter what and even if. They don't have to learn it. You don't get to use love as a consequence. No withholding it, no granting it conditionally. Are we clear? Love. Number two, air. I know you don't provide air, but you don't have any business depriving them of it. So let's get clear about that. Food, water, and shelter. Those are the five freebies. Now, everything else is negotiable. What do I provide is a really great question to ask when you're trying to come up with stage one consequences. And if it's, if it's not in the five freebies, you can use it as a consequence. 
So what about telecommunications? Oh, not on the list of five. So a cell phone or access to electronics, access to certain rooms in your house, um, what services you provide, all of these things that are things that you control. So you can use them as consequences. Now contrast that to stage two. We're still going to use consequences. We're going to kick in with communication and do a, little more, a lot more talking with our kids at stage two. At stage two, for example, you can sit down with your child and say, hey, what just happened? That kind of violates our family rules. The, and there's a consequence for that. What do you think your consequence should be? You know, that's an interesting question to ask kids. And as long as they're on stage two, you can have that conversation. If they're on stage one, they're not even listening to you right now. So you pick something that you control and you implement that instead. Some of the consequences that come up in stage two would include writing an essay, for example. I've had kids do this before as a consequence, right, for something that happened, but I want them to learn something. So they get to write a 500 word essay about why what happened violated the family rule or what would be a better choice that they could pick next time they're in that circumstance. Do you see how that's a stage two consequence? Because they could totally defy you and refuse to cooperate. If they refuse to cooperate, we know what stage they're on. And we've already got consequences for that. You know, one of the other beautiful things about consequences is that it puts you in a position of power as a parent. You get focused on what you control and you feel far less frustration about the things you don't control that your kids are doing. So keep that focus in mind and use those consequences effectively. If you're enjoying these parenting videos here on the channel, you are going to love the Parenting Power Up. Join me and Vicki for some really solid tools.